you all so much for coming. Um, my name is Phil Longman. I'm a senior fellow here at the New America Foundation and also uh, the co-author with Ray Bushara at my side uh, of a new book, uh, The Next Progressive Era. And uh, we are very grateful also to have with us today Mark Schmidt of the uh, American Prospect to comment and, and Rehan Salim um, of the Atlantic Monthly. Um, to give them their thoughts. Um, I want to begin by giving you a little idea of, of how we got into this uh, project. Uh, you probably noticed a couple of years ago that people who uh, used to call themselves liberals um, began calling themselves progressives. And um, from our perch, you know, we, we sort of first noticed this in this phenomenon of um, the net roots. Uh, you know the people that rallied for Dean in 2004, moved on to move, moveon.org, um, and uh, Daily Costs, uh, and we began to notice that they were referring to themselves as progressives, and we wondered what exactly that meant. And we're somewhat confused by the movement as a whole. It seemed to be animated um, by an exceptional um, distaste for George W. Bush, um, but also uh, an exceptional animus towards both of the Clintons, um, which was kind of ironic because during the same era we began to notice that the Clintons were doing things like funding the uh, and, and founding the uh, Progressive Policy Institute. And uh, in 2007, uh, Hillary herself came out to explain that she wasn't a liberal, she was a progressive. Um, that seemed to have many compounding ironies to us because, after all, um, progressivism as a term in American politics had kind of died out in the 40s. Uh, and it had died out because people who used to call themselves progressives began to think of it as an antique word that wasn't really appropriate to their generation. And so they started calling themselves liberals <coughs> instead, which was really confusing because liberals or liberalism had been a doctrine of the 19th century that favored um, open markets and small government, um, as the word is still used in the United Kingdom. So <clears throat> Americans, I guess, are not really very good at political labels. Um, but we thought it would be fun to go back and look at the original progressive era and find out who they were and what, if anything, um, we could learn from them. And that's the conceit of this book is to look at the broad range of uh, domestic policy ideas and ask uh, first what would the original <coughs> progressives have done and often the answer that comes back is something that is appalling and we have to completely reject um, but more often than not um, it's innovative and unexpected this is a very poorly and misremembered era now, when I say progressive era, what, what era am I talking about? Um, there's no official <coughs> date when any era starts or ends. Um, but as we use the term, we're talking basically the period that extends from the early 1890s and is definitely over by 1920. Um, now, it's an era that has amazing parallels with our own times, parallels that um, are in many ways more nuanced and profound than um, those we have today with the 1930s. Um, it began with a Great Depression that doesn't really have a name, um, that started certainly uh, in full force by 1893. Um, it began for reasons very much like our current economic downturn. In the 1880s, um, there was an explosion of mortgage credit uh, extended to particularly Midwestern farmers by uh, brokers, unlicensed, who took those mortgages, bundled them up, securitized them, sold them to European investors. Um, and when the economy started to go down in 1893, um, it all collapsed. Um, it was also an era unlike the 1930s, of tremendous globalization. Um, in fact, global trade as a percent of GDP 
would not get back to the levels it was at the turn of the last century until the 1990s. Part of this was European empires trading with their colonies, but also it was the integration of world grain markets, for example, so that American farmers for the first time had to worry about what the Argentine grain crop might be because it affected their prices. Uh, it was an era of massive um, global consolidation uh, in both finance and industry. The House of Morgan, Standard Oil. Um, it was an era in which, um, much like today, uh, the American consumer producer was um, deeply indebted uh, to predatory lenders. Um, today we know about payday lenders. It had its exact equivalent uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century in the form of, of salary day lenders who operated much the same, rent to own, all that financial crack um, was in circulation in the American public. Uh, at one point, uh, surveys found that uh, one out of five workers in New York City was in hock to a payday lender or a payday or salary day lender, um, paying interest up to 300 percent. Another parallel is with um, the deep threats posed to small-scale producers of all kinds. At the turn of the last century, the small scale, the face of that small-scale producer was typically the yeoman farmer, but also the small uh, store owner, the craftsman, who were being wiped out by the Sears catalog, by the ch growth of chain stores. Um, the analog today is this increasing phenomenon that many of us are experiencing of being thrown back, like it or not, into a new form of yeomanry, which we call um, being a consultant, being a free agent, being a freelancer, being a contingent worker. The economy in those days, and increasingly today, is marked by small-scale producers um, who cannot count on large corporations to look after them over their lifetime or to provide meaningful benefits. A related reason, uh, or a related parallel, is this was an era that had not much to say about the consumer, but a whole lot to say about the producer. The particular identity of Americans was as, the, as producers, not as consumers. And of course, as our president has said at the G20, the era in which the American consumer is the engine of American of global growth is coming to an end. There's lots of other interesting parallels. Uh, we talk about peak oil today. They talked about peak coal. Um, and coal production did peak in 1910. Um, timberland was also a big problem. We were at that era um, cutting down trees at three times the rate of natural growth. And there was mounting concern about environmental degradation. We also, they also faced a transportation crisis that's similar to our own um, with railroads um, being completely overwhelmed um, by congestion and breaking down. They had a broken health care system like our own. Um, the equivalent of today's Vioxx would be uh, um, Clark Stanley's snake oil. That, that uh, expression, never trust a snake oil salesman, that comes from Clark Stanley, who um, at the World Exposition in Chicago in 1998 caught the nation's attention by selling snake oil, which he milked from snakes in front of uh, an amazed audience. But then uh, when the progressive era got into full cotton and they you know, started the Food and Drug Administration, one of the first things they did is to test Stanley snake oil and found out it didn't have any snake oil in it. Uh, only turpentine and water. People were outraged. Uh, another, another point of parallel, of course, is this was an era of very, very rapid immigration and all kinds of troubles associated with assimilation and worry about it. Um, related to that, um, it was an era much like our own in which out of control individuals um, seem to be able to bend history over and over again, um, whether they be anarchists or syndicalists or people like Typhoid Mary who would walk around the city um, infecting everyone with her typhoid. Um, it was also an era, interestingly enough, in which pornography was a gigantic problem. This was the era in which the first peep shows were coming in, Nickelodeons. And it turns out that uh, the prime audience for that uh, were untended uh, working class kids who for a nickel could watch often extreme pornography 
um, that caused a lot of trouble. Another parallel is that while this was an era of tremendous um, scientific advance um, that makes our own technological advances seem but nothing, um, it was also an era marked by the rise for the first time in American history of fundamentalism. You know, William Bell Riley's The Fundamental Series um, first articulated fundamentalism. William Jennings Bryan brought it to great prominence in American politics. So it's an era in which we both have uh, uh, an increase in expertise and scientific understanding of the world and an increase in fundamentalist religious thinking of the world. But unlike today, the progressives really did something about it. You think about the election of 1912 and that election, the general election, there were four candidates. One was William Howard Taft, the incumbent. One was Woodrow Wilson, uh, the Democrat. One was Teddy Roosevelt reemerging as a bull moose progressive party candidate. And one was Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate. All four are running in the general election. What are they arguing about? Well, William Taft is saying, you guys keep calling me a stand pat or conservative, but I'm really a progressive. And TR and, and Wilson are in this big fight about who's the greater progressive. And so uh, you can say that in that election, uh, self-styled progressives mm -hmm. took almost 100% of the vote uh, with the remainder going to a socialist. <laughs> Times change. Now, if you think if we, if we in our era had been able to replicate the reforms of the progressive era, we would have done things like effectively re regulated Enron and Exxon long ago, busted the Microsoft monopoly, busted the Walmart monopoly, uh, affected a conversion of energy. Uh, remember, the, the uh, progressives were base, faced with these coal, coal strikes and shortages of coal. They managed to affect, in very rapid order, a transition to a new uh, energy economy based on petroleum, which was comparatively cleaner and more abundant. And they fixed the health care crisis that they had with uh, amazing effect, using mostly public health measures. Um, but the rate of uh, increased long, long, longevity in the early part of the 20th century, about three times what we're uh, achieving today, even as we commit 17% of the economy to health care. So what was the essence of what uh, progressivism was, and, and how did they make it work? I have to say, these were extremely complicated times. Uh, the pace of progress was faster than anything we're seeing today, all kinds of different factions and faces. <coughs> but I think what it comes down to, essentially, is, is two musty words that essentially define this sensibility. Those words are yeoman, yeomanry, and thrift. Now these are very, you don't hear these words much anymore, especially yeomanry. Um, but in 19th century and 18th century America, yeomanry was um, constantly referred to by presidents, um, most notably Thomas Jefferson, who painted the yeoman farmer as the ideal American character. Um, but also through the era of uh, the Republicans of Abraham Lincoln's generation who brought you the Homestead Act and the Morrill Act and other uses of public policy to try and make the world safe for the small scale producer. It was part of the theory of the founders that a nation composed primarily of freeholding citizens um, would make for a, it would be a check against tyranny um, because they would have the independence and freedom to make their own political decisions as opposed to being servile tenants. Now, coming into the progressive era, this idea was still very much alive. And a huge part of what the progressives were trying to do is to make the world safe for the yeoman, for the small scale producer of all stripes. And what was unique and different in those days than today, it seems to me, um, was that in building that coalition, um, there wasn't a blue state, red state <coughs> divide. Uh, Professor Tweez Tweezers at John Hopkins or Madison had co felt a common cause with the, with the prairie populist, with the yeoman farmer, um, in trying to make the world safe for the small scale producer, even if that involved increasing um, the size of government. The other big concept was thrift. Now, thrift today, uh, you know, what do you associate with thrift stores downscale? Um, miserly, um, but in 
at the turn of the century, there was the thing called the thrift movement. And thrift really informs everything that the progressives did. And it's the one thing that today's self-styled progressives actually have in common. <laughs> um, thrift, as the original progressives meant, um, is more akin to wise use, um, a holistic view of life. So it did involve money, and they did things like school banking to try and inculcate habits of financial thrift in school children. They took this very seriously. Um, but it also involved things like thrift of health, thrift of time. <laughs> These are odd formulations to our ears, but thrift of health meant moderation. The original root of thrift means to thrive. That's where it comes from. So they did all kinds of things to promote thrift of health. Thrift of time, well, they were totally opposed to waste, waste of everything. So wasting time was something that they got quite exercised about and informs our current associations with progressives with efficiency. What they were doing in being efficient was not wasting time, i.e. being thrifty. Now some of this thrift stuff can kind of resonate with or echoes in the counterculture of, of the 1960s and 70s it would seem that most of those people involved in that movement weren't really aware of, of this legacy of progressive thought, of thrift, but people who aspired to become small bookstore owners, people who wanted to become organic farmers, they would recognize themselves in this original thrift movement. People who are concerned about conservation, particularly, and about um, a superabundance of materialism, would understand the thrift movement and perhaps resonate it. Now there's an awful lot about the progressives that we have to reject, as I said. Um, this was an era in which 400 southern blacks every a year were being lynched. This is an era in which the same Supreme Court justice who upheld the constitutionality of the progressive income tax um, wrote the leading decision on Plessy versus Ferguson, um, upholding separate but equal. Segregation um, was a very real part of the progressive mindset. Um, I think for some progressives, I've watched a number of them move from being um, ardent advocates of civil rights um, to being strip, strict segregationists uh, in the course of five or six years as these lynchings um, persuaded a lot of progressive people that it probably would just be a good idea if a white woman and a black man never were in the same public place at the same time because that way she couldn't make some casual remark that would set off a white race riot. We have to keep these in context. It's also the era that brought us prohibition, which I think most of us have a settled opinion that that was a step too far. Uh, it's an era that had very little regard for constitutional rights, certainly not the regard we have today. Um, many progressive eras thought of the Constitution as, as vestigial. Um, and um, Teddy Roosevelt in 1912, campaigning on the um, progressive era, progressive party platform actually called for a popular repeal of, of federal judges. I mean, that's how much they disliked uh, constitutional rights. Had much more of an emphasis on social control, the greatest good for the greatest number. And of course, by the end of this era, we have the Palmer raids and the excesses um, done in the attempts to put down communism already. But that said, I think we have an awful lot to learn from the progressives um, because so many of the problems they face, we face today. Um, in the book, we cover a broad gamut of, of policy areas, including health care and transportation. Um, but today, uh, we're going to concentrate mostly on the financial parallels uh, with the American consumer and our financial architecture. And uh, to do that, I'm going to turn this over to, to Ray, who's a world expert in these questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ray Boshara. I'm uh, vice president and uh, director of the assets program here at New America. Um, it's, it's a real honor and pleasure to write a book with Phil Longman, uh, a superb fellow, a historian, public intellectual. And it's also an honor for me to share a stage with uh, Mark and Ray Hahn, some superb colleagues of mine. Um, as, uh, as 
Phil mentioned, uh, I'm going to look forward a little bit and talk about some of our policy ideas with regards to the economy. And uh, the, the question I'm going to try to answer is what would progressives make of today's economy and what would they have done with it? What recommendations might they have? I think, first of all, they would marvel, uh, as you might have guessed from Phil's remarks, at how similar the economic conditions uh, of the 1880s were to our own and, and how little we seem to have learned. Um, hopefully, um, I, don't, I don't think it's too late to learn from them. And, uh, and as Phil said, I think the progressives in many ways accomplished more than the New Deal economic reformers did, so I think we'd be wise to heed some of their lessons. So what did the economy look like back then? Uh, Phil mentioned a few of these things. It began with uh, unemployment that reached 18% in the 1890s. And the unemployment rate actually exceeded 10% for five or six years, which again, we never, we never accomplished that until the Great Depression uh, in the 30s. Uh, massive corporate consolidation, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, you know, the, the nation's financial architecture was manipulated by what Teddy Roosevelt called the predatory man of wealth, uh, and, it, and it caused great panic and fear among most Americans. In 1907, the, the worst, of that, worst of that era was when the Knickerbocker Trust uh, set off a wave of investment bank failures, leading to a 37% fall in share prices. 1,800 companies consolidated into, three, into 93. And as Phil mentioned, we, we, we reached a scale on, uh, of, of, of globalization and trade that we had never, never ever seen. We hadn't seen again until the 1990s. Um, a, a third feature, um, besides the unemployment, the mass uh, consolidation is, uh, as Phil mentioned, the subprime lending. Um, it's, it's really remarkable how uh, what happened then is pretty much what happened now, where you, 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 you know, these homesteaders were settling, settling the land. Uh, between 1870 and 1890, uh, the number of farms in the U.S. Uh, rose by nearly 80 uh, percent to four and a half million, uh, and it increased by another 25 percent by the end of the century. Um, but, you know, it's, it's easy to romanticize that, but in fact it was just a vast sea of indebtedness. For example, uh, Kansas uh, croplands were mortgaged to 45 percent, uh, 46 percent in South Dakota, uh, Minnesota 44 percent. And the remarkable thing about these levels of debt is this, this is land that people largely got for free under the Homestead Act. And so they were still having these debt levels. But again, what's really remarkable, too, is that they were bundled, securitized into mortgage-backed bonds, got peddled on European markets sold uh, to distant and uninformed investors who bore the ultimate risk. Just like today, the Chinese investor has no idea what risk he's sitting on. The European investors back then also really had no idea. And they, like today, used fraudulent origination practices to generate upfront quick profits. Um, a fourth feature is uh, the rise of, um, w well, uh, salary lenders. They were called salary lenders. We call them payday lenders today. Um, usury, of course, is, has been around for as long as human beings have been lending money to one another, and it's been condemned uh, by every religious tradition, Dante, the Puritans, the, uh, you know, everybody's condemned it. But nonetheless, it was quite an industry um, um, back then, and indeed, salary lending started uh, just shortly after the Civil War, uh, but by the Progressive Era, it had in fact expanded to, um, to every state, and they even had chains. They had national chains back then that did salary lending. And the rates there were as outrageous as today, people getting charged three to 400 uh, percent for their loans. Um, and as Phil mentioned, uh, in some cities, you know, one in five Americans uh, were, were uh, enslaved to some sort of a, a payday loan. And then a, a final, a final uh, challenge that they <coughs> faced or were outraged about, I should say, is the, what we call today the unbanked. Uh, the, you know, the progressive era ref reformers were just appalled, you know, that, that somebody could not find an institution, a financial institution, to hold their, save, their meager savings so they could start a business or, or build wealth or buy a home or, or, or whatever they wanted to do. Back then, financial institutions uh, you know, really were for, for well-heeled people. And if you went in with your meager savings, you were given the high-hat treatment. And, and the progressive era reformers were just completely alarmed uh, by that. And so the levels of the quote-unquote unbanked were rather high uh, at the time as well. 
And there were other villains besieging the uh, pocketbooks of Americans, deceptive mass advertising, patent medicines, whole range of faulty consumer products uh, uh, as well. So how did, how did progressives respond and what, what can we learn? Uh, as, as Phil mentioned, to understand the economic response of the progressives, we have to look at both the yeoman tradition and the ideal uh, of thrift. And, um, and Phil talked about those. So let me, let me just mention some of the successes that the progressive era reformers had. Um, first is you know, the massive consolidation of financial institutions and bank failures uh, could have led to uh, an, even, an even bigger depression, but in instead it led to the uh, creation of the Federal Reserve System in 1913. Uh, followed by the creation of 12 district and regional Federal Reserve Banks, which we still have with us today. Um, also, to spare workers, payday lenders, salary lenders, um, uh, you know, to bank the unbanked, uh, thrifts and credit unions came into existence uh, at this time as well. Um, Roy Bergengren uh, and Edward Filene of Filene's Basement, in case you're wondering where that came from, was really behind the charge that made this possible with the first credit union established in Massachusetts in 1909, uh, which then became the foundation for uh, the Federal Credit Union Act uh, in 1934. Another accomplishment was something called the Uniform Small Loan Act. Um, you know, basically, they were trying to cap, cap uh, usury, uh, and they decided that 36% was an appropriate rate. Uh, not that that's a good rate, but it, it was meant to be transparent and allow, uh, you know, to set rates to allow private capital so that lenders could compete in an open and honest and transparent way. Um, and uh, I think by 1915, six states had passed versions of the Uniform, Uniform Small Loan Act, and uh, gradually um, states all had these, uh, these laws. And they really existed on the books until about uh, the late 70s, early 80s, when uh, in a Supreme Court ruling, uh, a credit card ruling, the, the, you know, the, the Supreme Court basically said that usury rates apply only in, in the state in which a firm is located, not the, the states in which they actually do business. And that's the law that, that allowed credit card, the credit card industry and other kinds of um, um, abusive practices to, to, to get off the ground. And I, I think it's interesting, and Leslie Parrish, uh, I know who's here, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that there are now efforts to get these 36% caps back on the books uh, throughout the country. Uh, just let me mention three more things the uh, progressives accomplished. Uh, one was uh, a whole, uh, um, a, whole uh, a lot of uh, uh, immig immigrant banks. In 1913, for example, there were more than 200 so-called immigrant banks, uh, 55 of them for Italians, 22 for Germans, 16 for Poles, and six for Jews uh, as of 1913. And many of those have survived until today, although they have shed their exclusivity. Fourth, uh, uh, financial education. They didn't call it that, but that's something that the thrift educators very much believed in back then. Um, you know, there's something called the thrift the Education Thrift Service launched 7,000 school banks, which generated $39 million, uh, $39 million in deposits adjusted for inflation. Uh, and they did this through what today we call children's <coughs> savings accounts. And the final accomplishment I'll, I'll mention is, um, again, what we call behavioral economics today. Uh, they were pioneers uh, in that idea, as well as in one of their signature ideas, uh, 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 signature ideas today called conditional cash transfers, basically paying poor people to do what they should do anyway, send their kids to the doctor, keep their kids in school. But the, but, but the uh, progressive reformers uh, move forward. The, there's a group in Iowa called the Trimmers Club, which offered a penny a day to any Iowa boy who refrained from tobacco, liquor, gambling, and swearing. Uh, and after their first dollar, uh, the boys were required to deposit at least 50 cents uh, in a savings account to establish the habit of saving and to make sure that by age 18, they could make a good start in life and pay for college. It sounds very familiar to the work I do on the assets program. <laughs> um, so let me, let me just... Uh, my last, my last uh, set of remarks talk about lessons for today and some ideas as well. I, I think there are uh, so many lessons, of course. Uh, their, their challenges mirrored uh, our own. 
whether it's uh, exploding securitized mortgages, predatory lenders, financial goliaths, asset bubbles, and crashes. Um, but I also like to think that we can learn from and indeed match their accomplishments. Um, Mark Twain is, uh, is uh, said to uh, have uh, uh, said that history does not repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Uh, so the challenge is, um, you know, the challenge is certainly rhyme, and we wonder can the accomplishments rhyme um, as well. Uh, no doubt, uh, ushering in a new era of thrift, a new thrift, a new conservation, a new stewardship, whatever we want to call it, asset building, uh, you know, it's going to be a challenge since, of course, the nation has been under the spell of Keynesian, Keynesianism, uh, you know, since the New Deal. Uh, and Franklin Roosevelt himself remarked in 1932, I believe we are at the threshold of a fundamental change in popular economic thought. In the future, we are going to think less about the producer and more about the consumer. Of course, this was an enormous blow to both the thrift and the human ideals. Um, and as, as we, we realize that that, that model has, has sat, is saturated, uh, we, we, are, we are begged to, to consider new, new models. American com consumption actually now makes up 70% of the U.S. economy and 25% of the world's, and we've largely financed that consumption through debt. The collapse of the financial system is a reflection of the fact that we simply could not absorb any more debt. Um, so I, I, I think there are three really important lessons coming out of the progressive era that apply to our challenges today. First is that um, it's not just the, the, the progressives had not just a legal or a policy response, but instead they had an institutional response. I can't stress this uh, important, th this is a really important point. They built institutions like the Federal Reserve, like credit unions, like thrifts that are still with it today, and they made it significantly easier for, easier for people to do the right thing to improve their health, their wealth, and their happiness. So, you know, you can't just pass laws, you have to build institutions that reflect certain ideals. Uh, secondly, their model was not a purely rational one. Uh, it, it, was, it was informed today by what, uh, again, what we call behavioral economics and what some economists call soft paternalism, you know, sort of using the power of government to get people to kind of do the right things, like automatically enroll them in the company retirement plan and give them a choice to get out, as opposed to trying to get them to sign up in the first place. Um, their method was rational. They had a deep scientific method, um, but you know, you know, they did not use a narrowly defined notion of, of economics. The sort of the you know the, the the rational person that's posited by neoclassical economics. So it's very much based on real human behavior. And the third lesson I think is very important is that their their response was not piecemeal or isolated. You know, let's just take out the salary lenders, but it had a deeper, more inclusive one, you know, again, revolving around this broader ideal of thrift, uh, or what we might want to say today, con conservation or stewardship. So uh, let me close with just a few ideas on what we could do today to uh, bring back some of these ideals and uh, get our economy moving again. Uh, uh, you know, of course, we need to uh, you know, move back toward the centrality of the American producer, uh, promote small-scale property ownership, uh, production, and entrepreneurship. We, again, need to promote credit unions, small-scale banking, relationship banking. You know, the main thing that was lost in uh, the, 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 the subprime crisis in the progressive era, as well as today, was accountability. Relationships were gone. People who, who provided the loans uh, and people who received them didn't have a relationship. And we need to restore that. Um, Phil and my colleague, Ellen Seidman, have a proposal to bring back community banking and call for the creation of a community bank trust fund. Uh, basically, the challenge there is that you, you can't generate enough deposits from just local, local savers and investors. You have to find a way to bring in capital from outside sources to make these institutions uh, profitable. Um, secondly, I think um, we, um, we also need to uh, promote debt reduction, savings, and wealth accumulation, what, what we call asset building, sort of clunkily in my program. Uh, you know, but I think we need to think about doing that uh, from birth to life. And I think, you know, for us, the idea revolves around taking uh, what we call American stakeholder accounts um, and, um, and, and, and making those available to the whole population. And here, we recommend um, uh, sort of copying, mimicking uh, the, the, the aptly named Thrift Savings Plan, which is a federal savings plan for about 4 million federal workers. Let's take that. Let's start it at birth. Let's make it available to, to all Americans. 
And, uh, and, and our policy recommendations really, uh, you know, with that platform in place, or even if it's not, we can make progress. But, you know, what are the four moments in our lives when, you, you, when people can save and build wealth? Again, taking in mind this behavioral view of, you know, capturing, capturing the right moment to do the right thing at birth. Uh, and we have a bill in Congress called the Aspire Act to do that. When you enter the workforce, uh, retirement plans, uh, leveraging uh, savings and wealth and debt reduction opportunities at tax time. And then fourth, when buying a mortgage, uh, when you buy a home, your, your largest asset. And here, we propose a, a, a default mortgage, a sticky, quote unquote, opt out mortgage. Basically, you know, the first mortgage that everybody would be offered would be a, a 30 year fixed instrument. We call a basic American mortgage. And if you wanted to get another product, the disclosure requirements would have to be very high, and uh, the, the product would have had to have earned a, a, an Energy Star rating. And a final uh, recommendation I'll mention today is that, uh, you know, for many people, they, you know, uh, another important in their financial lives, unfortunately, is the lottery, when they buy a lottery ticket. Um, and uh, 43 states now run lotteries. These are one, one of the largest anti-thrift institutions that exist uh, in this country. Um, as my colleagues and Phil's colleagues at the Institute's, Institute for American Values uh, recommend in their report for a new thrift, let's repurpose the lottery into pro-savings institutions, and we actually have examples of that in, uh, in, um, in South Africa and, and Britain. So I will close with a quote from uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, we are in this world not to provide for ourselves alone, but for others, and that is the basis of economy, so that thrift and economy and everything that administers to thrift and economy supply the foundation for our national life. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Ray and Phil, for for inviting me back to New America. Um, uh, some, as some of you may know, I, I uh, was a senior fellow here for uh, for three years until going over to the American Prospect last uh, last July. I actually, remain a senior fellow in name only, so I'll, uh, I'll wear that title today. Um, I think this this book, I, I you know, in in all the time that I was here, I think we often. Uh, one of the wonderful things about New America is that there's a lot of heterogeneity of, of viewpoints uh, here, and we often struggle with what what actually could, brings brings it together. What are what are some things that 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 knit what we're all about uh, together? And I've never seen it done better uh, than in this book. I think it's it's a remarkable achievement on that you know rather parochial <laughs> dimension uh, alone, but it's a, it's a it's a great achievement in many other ways as well. I was uh, I, this is actually the third panel in a month that I've been on on progressivism. In some in some form or another, but the other two uh, really took the form took that form in which progressive is just you know a kind of flag of convenience um, for people who maybe you know got scared off by those TV ads that said liberal 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 um, that that were very popular uh, until they stopped working um, uh, for for a, for a while um, and 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 doesn't really doesn't really get into the into the. The, the the actual meaning of, of of the word I saw yesterday that it's the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, of the book the elements of style a strunk and white book and I remember one of the one of the things I got out of that book is uh, you know at a young age is a reminder that every word actually is is freighted with is a metaphor and ha carries a lot of meaning within it and the word progressive just just mean well we're sort of liberals but we're not really uh, is is to overlook the enormous amount of meaning that that Ray and Phil uh, have have drawn out of the uh, of the word and and the era, um, and I'm somebody who's never really uh, I've, I've 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 actually sort of always identified as a liberal, partly because I don't feel I don't need that flag of convenience. I'm not running for office, and um, and I also think there's a lot in that in that liberal tradition, which is not not because I'm more left actually, but because there's a, there's a, there's a lot actually in the libertarian dimensions of the liberal liberal tradition um, that that I find valuable, and so and of and while I um, while I love lots of things in this book, I think that the I'm, I'm I, I was sitting here thinking how much would I do I really agree with Ray that progressives accomplished more than the New Dealers did? I think that's a that's a daring uh, assertion. I, I hope we have a little bit of um, of debate about that. I think that the institutions that the progressives built were necessary preconditions um, for for what the New Deal was able to do. I think the New Deal was able to 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 
build a build a longer era, and and I don't want to I don't want to throw. I guess I'm not ready to throw out Keynesianism completely um, for for all its for all its achievements. So I guess maybe that's why I'll still hold a little bit of the liberal label for myself um, here, while nonetheless really. Um, uh, endorsing this endorsing this book it 's interesting to think back uh, about ten years ago there was a little wave of of interest in progressivism michael lynn 's uh, next American nation was a key uh, text uh, there uh, a couple books by e j Dion why Americans hate politics and um, the book that followed that which i can 't remember the name of um, all all represented that looking a similar look back into the progressive era and try to and try to draw out um, uh, some lessons. Mostly, I think they were into they were looking. I think more at the intellectual history than at the history on the ground and, and the kind of kind of ground level assumptions uh, and practices that that Ray and Phil have looked at. Um, and and but it was a very it was an important. Uh, kind of, it was an important moment drawing on, you know, bringing to light people like Herbert Crowley uh, and their and their influence in that in that era. Um, uh, and I read th there was a, a critique of that of that set of books came out a couple of years ago, which I pulled off my shelf last night, called "The Poverty of Progressivism" by a political scientist, Jeff Isaac. And I remember uh, Isaac had Isaac argued that we were overlooking the those who wanted to revive the progressive era tradition and and bring it into modern politics even even acknowledging that there were a lot of similar transformations going on in our society that there were that there were kind of things going on in the ground in uh in the progressive era that that weren't applicable to our current era so you couldn't just sort of take things you liked from uh from the pol political practice of the of the progressive era and graft it onto our onto our own time and I think one one of the things that's interesting about what Ray and Phil have done in this book is they're they're kind of doing the same thing from the bottom up. I mean, they're kind of actually starting with the assumptions on the ground and practices on the ground. Plus, it's ten years later, um, so that Isaac's critique of that of that earlier look at progressivism said, you know, look at the things that were going on in that in the progressive era. You know, the, there was a fairly uniform Protestant culture, and it was really driven by the social gospel, by a kind of liberal Protestantism, not, you know, in our time, not quite the case, much more religious diversity and, 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 a, and a much more, uh, much more right wing, much more of the dominance of the religious right, which doesn't have quite as much of a place for, for the kind of social gospel ideas that there was a kind of class consciousness at the time that we don't have now. Um, so that a lot of, a lot of progressivism was really a it was it was essentially a, an effort to kind of save capitalism from you know a very active very aggressive uh labor movement the progressive era is actually kind of embedded in a long fairly conservative era i mean the the you know t r was president because McKinley was elected in eighteen ninety six that's the era that Karl Rove always identified as you know the thirty years of of conservative republican rule and it was thirty years of conservative republican rule with with these blips which were t r and 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 wilson um and and actually kind of goes back a little further than than that as well before you get the real transformation of american politics in 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 nineteen thirty two um uh, Isaac pointed out, you know, that there was a, a real rise in enthusiasm about social science and the expertise it could bring to problems. We kind of trust there was a trust in experts that had kind of broken down uh, in, in our time, and that there was a richer uh, public sphere. And I think it's really interesting to look at the at the world we live in now and think, you know, how many of those assumptions actually are more applicable, or really are coming into play now. Not necessarily in the same form, um, but I think our religious life life is much richer than than maybe we thought it was. Um, a few years ago, I think that I don't think class conscious. I'm I, I, I'm not a, a I, I'm not I don't think we have the same. I, I don't I don't put much weight on the populist reaction to the bailouts in Wall Street and so forth. Um, but clearly, there are there are there's a breakdown of some of the assumptions about about how we do capitalism that kind of opens it up to some, the transformations that are similar to what the progressive era uh, uh, brought it, brought into place, even without necessarily, you know, a, a labor movement that's, that's, that's ever going to crack 11 percent of, um, but, it, but it's, you know, similarly, and we have, you know, we're able to, I think the, I think the era of rejecting expertise and the, the anti, uh, 
uh, the 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 era of Sarah Palin and Joe the Plumber as our political icons is you know we're, we're past that. We we need the expertise and we know it. And and there's I think a a respect for that that we that we had been lacking. Um, and I think the really interesting. Um, the, one of the most fascinating points in the in the book is about the search for order, and I think there's a there's a sense among all of us that there's a that there are elements of that there are things that have to be brought back into a kind of right balance in our in our society. That I'm not sure we had that that sense ten years ago, and I think the emphasis on building institutions, even if the transformation created by the institutions such as the Federal Reserve and things like that, even if the individual transformation for the for the average American um, try, you know, who needs a base of security in order to be a yeoman, in order to get ahead, even if that transformation was far less than what was created, obviously, by the, by the, by the real security platform of the New Deal, it's still essential to have those institutions and have those institutions take the, you know, be, be kind of solid and established. What we were doing in the in the financial world over the last 10, 15 years, I think, was was thinking that markets can do it all by shifting, by pricing things and, and shifting them and moving them around rather than putting them in a solid, rather than putting risks and choices on a solid base where people are actually taking responsibility for them. And I think to do that, to to, to get past, then that, that has collapsed and the next year has to involve creating more solid institutions that work on the ground where people live and, and enable them to be yeoman, enable them to save, and enable them to then take the chances that, uh, that, that allow them to get ahead, whether they're independent workers or are, or are employees of a, of a larger company. All right, I went on for longer than I should. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Raihan Salam. It's a real honor to be here, as uh, I've long been very interested in the work of, of Ray and Phil. Uh, in fact, I met Phil in 2004 after reading his wonderful book, The Empty Cradle, that was so idiosyncratic and drew on so many different traditions uh, to develop a set of <laughs> policy proposals that were really, really unfamiliar in the landscape at the time, so it was a real inspiration for me. Um, Basically, I just want to talk about a couple of themes uh, and also contradictions uh, within uh, this idea of progressivism. Uh, first, um, Phil was talking briefly about the relative disregard for constitutional liberties during the progressive era, and I thought this was very interesting because, you know, when you think about it, our understanding of constitutional liberties, etc., is in some respects very new and in some respects an encounter with um, a set of historical events that had nothing to do with the founding. Um, there's a wonderful book by a guy named David Sipley called uh, Liberalism in the Shadow of Totalitarianism. And his argument is that, you know, basically in the 1930s and 40s, as American intellectuals confronted Nazism and fascism, they began to reconceive uh, of American ideology as uh, the obverse, as a kind of, you know, negative image of totalitarianism. And so uh, Americanism had to be a kind of anti-paternalism. Now, this is an idea that's still with us today. You see it uh, among civil libertarians. You see it with economic libertarians. It's the idea that you know, Americans are fundamentally anti-authoritarian, that their institutions should resist paternalism whenever possible. And this has clearly had a, an interesting uh, effect on the shape of our welfare state. But the problem is that this displaced the older tradition, the progressive tradition, and also the various traditions that the progressives built on, the conscience, wigs, etc. cetera. Uh, simply refers to this as virtue progressivism, the idea uh, that marries a kind of elitist technocracy with a public paternalism that is motivated by the social gospel, by a religious sensibility, uh, and, and, and thus a belief that you know, redistribution is rooted in a desire to kind of better the lives of others through a kind of moral teaching. This seems very odd to us because you know, when we think of the liberal left, and I think that uh, Mark is very right to maintain a distinction between liberalism and progressivism in that there is a kind of more kind of robust libertarianism to the one tradition. Um, you know, we think of civil libertarianism as being very close to the heart of it. We think of individualism. Uh, we think of, again, this kind of anti-authoritarian tendency as being very central to it. Whereas progressivism was really about thrift. It was really about social discipline and the ways in which social discipline can actually allow families to kind of care for themselves under this kind of human ideal. So I think that you know, it's, it's really kind of hard to map out how that tradition maps onto our own left-right politics. I think um, Phil and Ray asked me to be on this panel in part because you know, I come from the political right. And so uh, you know, though I kind of am attracted to some of their ideas, I'm clearly approaching it from a different perspective. But it's interesting because this human ideal 
so we don't hear about it, we don't talk about it very much, but there are ways in which palimpsests of this idea are very much with us, uh, are very robust, and that actually just kind of ramp up in our politics every now and again. Um, you know, there's a wonderful book that I read on the recommendation of a fellow fellow, Steve Tellis, uh, called White Flight by historian Kevin Cruz. And basically what he tried to do is understand the origins of the resistance to the civil rights movement in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's very interesting because what you see happen is that, you know, you saw the GI Bill, which is loved by many modern day progressives as something that did actually, you know, help build assets that helped spread wealth in a broadly egalitarian way. But it did so through spreading ownership of private property. Uh, it did so in this kind of very traditional yeoman like way. So, you know, whereas the yeoman of old would, uh, you know, sort of become homesteaders, the yeoman of the 40s and 50s would, you know, kind of go into the suburbs and acquire property, etc. But the thing is that, you know, once desegregation began, once a lot of other measures that were designed to create a more kind of racially egalitarian country uh, began, many of these yeomen felt that these properties that had been given to them through the aid of the federal government were under assault. And so they turned to a kind of less publicly oriented political framework uh, that, you know, kind of led to this kind of right of center political resistance. It's very interesting the way that these things intersect, because, again, that spread of wealth, that spread of assets wouldn't have happened in the absence of the GI Bill and other related policies. But then when it seemed as though that bargain between the, between the state and these families and individuals was disrupted, then there was a lot of resentment. So even in the genealogy of the conservative movement, you see these kind of weird blowbacks and palimpsests of progressivism as well. And I think that human ideal remains very potent, except that we don't have a, a, a really vivid or, uh, you know, so we don't have a really good way of articulating sort of some of these ideas, namely the interrelationship between culture and economics. Uh, you know, Mark was talking about the value of the New Deal and whether or not the New Deal was more impactful over time. But it's also true that, you know, progressivism had a funny relationship with the New Deal, which is something that's discussed uh, to some extent in the book. Uh, you know, for example, you had a, a large group of, uh, you know, women who were social workers, sociologists, uh, who, you know, later feminist historians like Glenn, uh, Gwendolyn Mink uh, labeled maternalists. And Phil discussed them in his book, The Empty Cradle, to some extent. Uh, you know, these women were very keen on reversing some of the social changes that happened during the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, you had a sharp increase in the number of women in the workforce, etc. And what they believed is that in order to have a more kind of stable, yeoman-like economy, you needed to have a family wage. You needed to have the state collaborate with these very traditional ideas of family arrangements. But of course, you know, traditional family arrangements is kind of a funny term because these so-called traditional family arrangements really required a lot of state support in order to exist, in order to flourish. And also they were capturing only a kind of brief historical moment. So, you know, even in the New Deal era itself, you both had this kind of technocratic, uh, you know, liberal tradition, but then you also had these progressives who were in tune with the populace, who were very concerned about building bulwarks around family life. Um, so again, I think that, you know, even now we have this really kooky mishmash tradition, and then at the elite level, you have, you know, kind of coherent, you know, um, classical liberal ideology, and you have coherent kind of social democratic ideology, but neither of these things really mesh with the American tradition the way that the old progressivism and the old populism did. Um, and, you know, we oftentimes marry these two things because, again, the progressives were elitist technocrats who wanted to kind of revive neighborhood and family life. Um, yet there was oftentimes resentment on the, on the part of the people who were the recipients of this kind of largesse. Um, so, you know, in, in conclusion, I just want to talk a little bit about how conservatives can think about some of these issues that are raised in the book. Um, in Britain, David Cameron has talked a lot about uh, the human ideal, albeit using different words, has talked a lot about the idea of having uh, you know, citizens take ownership of state institutions. There's a way in which the administrative state actually seems to sap competence out of communities, or at least that's you know, kind of argument that's embraced by a lot of thinkers from Christopher Lash to contemporary center-right and libertarian thinkers. And so one idea is rather than be hostile to the state necessarily, one way is to use a kind of social and cultural alchemy to give families and individuals and neighborhoods ownership of state institutions, the state institutions that impact their lives most directly. This is an idea that a lot of people found very attractive. It's an idea that animated the New Labor Project to some extent uh, in its early days. It looks to things like the working class friendly societies of the 1900s. It looks to sort of many of the insights of the progressive tradition as well, uh, lending libraries that were controlled by working class communities, et cetera. But there's a basic problem with this, which is that 
this idea of self-government, which I, I certainly find very attractive, is in tension with our egalitarianism. Uh, another term that's, uh, you know, kind of common to, that's become au courant in Britain is the idea of the postcode lottery. The idea that, you know, merely by virtue of living in one zip code rather than another zip code, one municipality rather than another, you get a radically different quality of services. Now, if you really believe in robust self-government, that is inevitably going to be part of our lives. You know, the idea of you know, putting responsibility in the hands of families and neighborhoods means that families and neighbors will suffer the consequences made by public decision making, made by you know, their representatives. Uh, but again, you know, there are going to be a lot of people who fall through the cracks, and that comes back to the kind of elitist technocracy. So the, the issue is, you know, where do you strike that balance between the populist insight that people want ownership and control over their own lives? Uh, and the progressive insight that actually this paternalism has a really valuable place, uh, that actually cultivating virtue doesn't mean leaving people to their own devices, but actually means using education in a very kind of robust and aggressive way. And that kind of progressive really requires a lot of cultural self-confidence on the part of political and social elites. And it's not clear to me that we have that right now. So um, I've thrown a lot of ideas out at you, and I hope some of that at least makes sense. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for some questions, and um, I'm hoping that um, since we are on C-SPAN, that when you ask a question that you summon the mic from Danny in the blue sweater over there, who will make sure that your voice is preserved for posterity. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm Cecilio Morales with the Employment and Training Reporter. I'm interested in the in the progressive area, you had uh, vocational education, the trade schools emerging. And, uh, and that particular uh, co contribution was not mentioned in the presentations. I wondered if you have anything to say about what was done then at that time to, says to what should be done now, particularly with a lot of talk of middle skills for shovel-ready projects and all these sort of things. That, there is a lot of talk that maybe people aren't ready for, don't, can't pick up the shovel and go and do it yet. You know, they have to need some training and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. <clears throat> I wonder what you say about that. Well, uh, this wasn't a gigantic movement, but there, uh, of course you had a well-developed apprenticeship system in those, and um, around the turn of the century, you're gonna get kids tracked into vocational tracks you know within high schools but one of the things I was struck by in researching this is how um, if you were training to become a carpenter or a machinist or something in that era um, you would know your Shakespeare the vocational training there was such a moral um, component to even vocational training um, that knowing your Shakespeare knowing your Bible was very much part of the curriculum um, you know we may be coming into an era where uh, we have too many college students <laughs> um, and where the real job opportunities are gonna come um, not in um, manipulating uh, information but in actually making stuff, um, which of course what Progressive Era was all about, is making stuff. And um, so I think there, in that dimension too, there's probably a lot we can learn in, um, in terms of restructuring <laughs> education. Steve in the back. Yeah, hi, it's Steve Tellis, a professor at Johns Hopkins and a fellow at New America. Um, one thing that, that you de-emphasized, I know because you were emphasizing policy, was when I think of the progressives, and maybe it's because I'm a political scientist, I think of books like Steve Skoranek's Building a New American State or Dan Carpenter's The Forging of Bureaucratic Autonomy, that in some sense the central project of this era was really a project of, of, uh, of rising professionals, right? That is, people who actually believed that they had a set of actual technical knowledge of how to manipulate the world, um, trying to actually get control over the state, to, to build what, uh, what uh, Carpenter calls bureaucratic autonomy, separate from um, what, uh, what Skoranek called the state of courts and parties, this older, um, in some sense excessively democratic from their point of view, uh, form of governance. And so I'd, I'd like you to comment a little bit about if there's a parallel in terms of governance style uh, that goes along with the policy suggestions that you're talking about, and who's really the agent for this, uh, this project. In the pro progressive era, 
clearly this rising group of, uh, of professionals who are connected to, again, professions that are just starting to congeal, we're the agent, um, but who's the carrier for this, this project? Whose interests are sort of intimately connected to this uh, in a way that this can act these ideas can actually be connected to something like a movement as opposed to three guys in a fax machine? <laughs> um, I'll take a stab on that if you want. Um, um, I mean, there is certainly a side of the progressive era that uh, is brought to you by well-educated professional wasps. Um, it's part of what you were alluding to. Um, but if you go back and you look at the actual pattern of legislative victories, um, the key support at a, at a legislative level um, came from states that are today red. And it really is a populist progressive alliance. So it's, it's not just all about a new class, you know. Um, the thing about the progressive era is that ever since it ended, every generation that's come along since has had some grudge against it. And, and, and it's basically rewritten history. So it's very hard to get at nowadays. But, you know, the first generation that came along were the, the doughboys, the lost generation. They came back to an America where, you know, they took away our beer and gin, right? So they, they, uh, they didn't have much nice to say about the progressives. Um, you know, uh, in the, in, for a later generation of liberals, they saw themselves and were indeed uh, in, in competition with uh, the rise of totalitarianism, um, uh, with gigantism. Um, they saw the, their key project as being how to match uh, an advanced state of mass production with an uh, advanced state of commensurate state of mass consumption, um, which in my thinking is really what the New Deal was mostly about. Um, then you have, you know, coming into the, the 1950s, you know, people like Richard Hofstetter writing The Age of Reform. Uh, many of us were compelled to read this in college, um, you know, which <laughs> basically, you know, paints the progressives as a bunch of uh, small town do-gooders filled with status anxiety and a, a yearning for Americana. Um, then you have, you know, the new left comes in in the 60s and they're painting, the, they're concentrating on what the progressives did to uh, the wobblies and the, and the commies and how they weren't sufficiently uh, um, radical. Um, and then coming into the 80s and 90s, we have the new critical histories in which they're drawing attention to the, the, the profound racism of progressives. So there's many different <laughs> vantage points, right? <laughs> and some of them, some of them might be right. Some of them might be right. I mean, you know, it's it's um, you know, it's a complex time, just like our own, right? And many different facets. Um, but I do think to try and wind back to your original question, I think the, on on the question of expertise, um, I think the progressives got some things wrong, particularly in the realm of healthcare. Um, what they got right in healthcare was mostly emphasizing a, a public health approach, a population level approach. Um, where uh, we do things like um, <clears throat> have women organized into what they called municipal housekeepers who went out into the cities and tried to improve the environment, uh, refuse and, and sewer gas and all that kind of stuff. And that was very important to raising productivity. But at the same time, you know, you have the founding of John Hopkins University um, and the, the so-called um, professionalization of medicine, which seemed like something long overdue. Um, and in the context of the time, uh, you already had the, the railroads were already starting to, to run their own hospitals. Uh, they were kind of inventing the HMO. And there were all these yeoman doctors out there who said, yeah, we don't want any part of this. So the grand bargain was uh, yeoman doctors got to be yeoman doctors, but they also credentialed themselves and committed as a profession to self-regulation and higher scientific standards, more rigorous um, training of doctors which was good as far as it went, but it led to our current health care system, and so you have to question its providence some. But yes, sir. Oh, hi, I'm Mike Oldshausen. Um, you, you spoke, I thought, rather romantically about a return to the small-scale producer. And other than small banks, which make small loans or maybe microloans, that kind of thing, that's, that's a kind of small-scale production. What do you have in mind? Uh, you know, the American consumer has become very accustomed to products with high design value, <coughs> high production value. And to achieve these values, you need to have a fair amount of capital uh, to get the machining, the tooling, and so on and so on. 
That's not something you can make in a garage. It's not something a small you know, shop can usually make. There are, there are a few exceptions to that, but generally speaking, it's quite difficult. I, I'd like to hear from you your vision of the small scale producer. Okay. Um, well, part of it, we're already, it's already fact complete in the sense that more and more of us are not salary men. We're not belonging to gigantic corporations where we'll spend our own lives. We, we go out there as entrepreneurs, as freelancers, and we make uh, a living uh, for ourselves. And the, the percentage of uh, American workers that answer to that description is constantly increasing. You're looking very skeptical, but... No, I'm talking about... <laughs> If you, if, if the, the health care, when you, when you are sick, you are going to get a call from some lady in Georgia calling you out of your house, quer querying you about how much health care you're using. She's employed as a contract worker from a health insurance company, right? Contract workers. If you think, hold that thought in your head. That, those are people who don't work for health care benefits or any other kind of employer-provided benefits. They're on their own. Um, they contract with gigantic institutions. But they are themselves little enterprises. Oftentimes they don't want to be, but that's what our economy yields up. And without taking too much time, I'll say I th there are things in the realm of technology um, that suggest that many things that were once produced in the home or in the craft shop may be again. Um, I mean, we've already got a kind of home production in journalism called the blogosphere. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> but we also, you know, there's new machines like um, the personal fabricator, which basically allows you to print with, with a printer 3D products. I mean, this is a real world thing in use by industry today, where if Nike, for example, wants to be able to prototype sneaker to try it out on people, they will print the sneaker, okay, using nanoparticles. and. Um, Saab, the car company, when they build prototype parts, that's what they do. They don't have some guy machine one part. They print the part. So that's a little, you know, over the edge. But I, right, even right now, for $30,000, you can go out and buy one of these things and make stuff. Yes, sir. Merrill Guzner. Uh, I have a... You, I, I, don't, I wonder if it's in the book, because you overlook some of the, I think, one of the tremendous... Uh, successes of the progressive era. It was the era where we had the first universal health care system. It was called workers' compensation. And the same thing was true of the unemployment insurance system was created in that era. And uh, there was also, I think, th something you didn't mention that I think ought to be mentioned was is the importance of political reform in that era. I spent many years in Ohio and in Cincinnati in particular, where it was a scion of the Taft family, which was a classic Republican family, of course, who actually got involved in city hall reform and, you know, trying to do all of that. But what was notable about all three of those things was is that there was this, um, it was state and local. It was something that you could very much do on the ground. And what's been not notable in the last decade, really, and where you've sort of begun to understand a lot of the problems that have led to the current economic crisis, that we didn't have that kind of experimentation going on. So my question sort of is, is there a political, has something, I mean, my own feeling is, is that we no longer have the, in, in the progressive area, you had factories and farms. So capital was rooted in the, in the community, and it couldn't fly as easily as it could today. Today, capital is much more mobile. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we don't have a political basis for doing the kind of experimentation at the state and local level. That's my own feeling, um, but maybe you feel differently. Hmm. That sounds like a question from Mark. Well, I think it is. I think the, um, this one, I think the, um, as, as somebody who's, who's worked a lot on political reform, it's, and, and maybe it's one reason that, that, that I resist a little bit of the progressive tradition because that is really where the elitism of the, of the kind of mugwump reformer uh, comes in, that it's largely procedural. I mean, TR as the, as the, as the first um, uh, great political reformer, I mean, they did some interesting things, but they didn't connect it to people's real lives. So it was, the, it was that kind of technocratic procedural reform that was unrelated to the actual political aspirations of of of, of people who were who were who were trying who were trying to be heard. So that's the the classic um, uh, strike against it. I mean, I think we are in an era where there's both a mood for more political reform and an opportunity for it. That's another thing that I think 
you know, begins with that first wave of interest in in the progressive era ten years ago. The the McCain, who was a campaign finance reformer, drawing explicitly on Teddy Roosevelt and that and that model. But I think we're now in an era where we're able to see it not just you know in terms of do what they did because that was actually that was the most limited that was the most elitist i think dimension of the uh of the of the era but that's much more tied into the actual surge of political participation and engagement and and involvement that 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 we are actually in the in the middle of now yes sir uh, thanks uh gary mitchell from the mitchell report i want to uh pose a question uh, in sort of in two parts. Um, the first is to get you to talk a little bit more about this sort of distinction between liberal and progressive and, uh, and, and I'll, I'll wonder out loud whether, uh, but aside from the sort of the, the, the baggage that came along with, you know, the L word, if, if we put that aside, I'm interested in what, you're, what you learned about the distinction between progressives and liberals and, and, uh, and, and whether one way to look at that, for example, is that, uh, that being a liberal is more about an ideological uh, uh, mindset, whereas being progressive, uh, the, the, the progressives have historically been more interested in or the institutional uh, component of that. That's a, that's a question. And, um, and the second thing is, um, you, you uh, and, and maybe you've said this, I just want to be sure I understand it. You've said that if you, um, if you um, were to, f to, to, to find two words that described progressivism in that 1890 to 1920 period, it would be yeoman and thrift. And my question is, if we're looking at a new progressive era, are the two characteristics going to be yeoman and thrift or something else? Pretty good. Well, let me take a stab at this one. I, I think Mark put his finger on it fairly well, uh, the distinction between progressive and liberalism when he alluded to the libertarian tradition. And I, I assume that's how that word migrated from the 19th century to today's meaning, is it does have that streak of libertarianism that puts a great emphasis on the Bill of Rights. Um, and you can see this in today's self-styled progressives. If you scratch them very much, you find out that on everything except economics, they are really profound libertarians, right? So that they, they um, do not want the state regulating reproductive rights, for example. Um, and uh, there's a tremendous um, strain of individualism in today's progressivism that um, I think has some relationship to, to um, 19th century late savior capitalism, frankly. Um, so I think that's the big difference. One, the, other, the other difference here is that we're, we're not interested in throwing out Keynesianism either, <laughs> right? But we are coming through a long era in which the dominant paradigm was that we have this advanced system of mass production that we more or less take for granted and we get ourselves into trouble when consumption can't keep up with it. So the New Deal takes all these policies like Social Security, like the Wagner Act, to try and bring up the, the spending power and the effect of consumer demand to match this, you know, and this wasn't something just that Keynes thought of. I mean, people like Townsend, the Townsend movement, you know, was r running around the country um, organizing the elderly in the 30s around the plan that, that every person over 60 would get $100 a month on condition that they spend it in a month, right? I and mean, it was a kind of intuitive understanding that that's the problem of our time, and the elderly can be recruited to uh, increase consumption. Today, nobody would say that the biggest problem of our time is that we have uh, insufficient consumption and not enough production. I mean, we, we are uh, in an era that basically cracked up financially, and, and many would say in, in terms of environment, too, um, through excess consumption. So somehow we have to turn the, the corner um, in, in a very finessed way, because for as long as the economy is, um, is poor, doing as poorly as it is, obviously we have to stimulate, right, 
Um, but on the other side of it, we have to get back to a, con a conception that looks at, at um, you know, the, the, the liberal Keynesian looks at thrift as antisocial and as waste as stimulus, right? Whereas the progressive looks at stimulus as waste. And um, that's the difference that we, you know, have to somehow uh, make um, because the era in which mass consumption driven by uh, debt, let alone foreign debt, you know, obviously just it's not sustainable. So, mm -hmm. yes, sir. David Fishman. On my way in, I took a very quick look at the books index and didn't see any reference to foreign affairs or anything like that. And you also haven't mentioned that this afternoon. I want to ask a general question with a particular example you used. Um, how does the progressive movement today relate to international affairs, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And just chronologically, you mark the end of the progressive era, the 1920, shortly after the end of World War One. Any connection, uh, coincidence, causation, uh, what relationship? Mm -hmm. But more important today, of course. Well, we, we consciously limited ourselves to domestic policy, but just to answer in the book, but. Um, you know, another feature of many progressives, TR most famous among them, was imperialism, right? Um, uh, progressives had a very clear sense of who they were and who Americans were. Um, and some of what they did that's alarming, um, you know, is actually rooted in the idea that there is a clear American character and it's a good thing to the point that we will proselytize it. Missionary work was a tremendous enthusiasm of that time. Um, the white man's burden, right? Um, that's a side of progressivism that, um, uh, to my taste, wasn't particularly appealing. But, um, you know, they were in the Philippines and having just the hardest time as we have in Iraq, uh, surging and doing all kinds of stuff to <laughs> try and get out of there. Now, of course, there was an opposition to all that, too. Um, and whether you want to call that opposition progressive or not, I don't do it. I guess maybe the settled answer would be that they were kind of split on, on that question. Does that sound right, Rion? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Good day. Peter Morris with the National Congress of American Indians. I was interested in your um, kind of identifying some of the sins of the progressive movement 90 years ago and more. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the challenges that the progressive movement and the liberal movement uh, faces, particularly with regard to communities of color today, and how we might avoid in 90 years' time having a conversation where we have to reject those pieces of progressivism or liberalism. Hmm. Oh, that's a tough one. You guys want to remember, remember this about the progressives, you know, that quintessential progressive characters did things like start Indian colleges start Negro colleges, um, start settlement houses, right? They went into the slums, they went into the reservations with earnest goo-goo missionary zeal, right? Thinking that what that immigrant needs is to be acquainted with the American tradition and assimilated. And they, were, they had no concept of multiculturalism except as something, you know, dangerous, right? So that's... That's a side of it, and that's where the, the libertarian streak in modern progressivism gets queasy, right? Um, this is very much informed by evangelicalism at the time, right? Now, I think as a country, the decision we have to take somehow collectively is can we sustain current rates of immigration and take assimilation basically for granted as something that will work itself out, or do we um, acknowledge that the progressive, the assimilation that came about in the last progressive era wasn't something that came about by accident. It was something that was socially engineered, largely, um, through the creation of these new institutions, through settlement houses, through active <coughs> consideration. You sound like you want to say something. Well, I, just, I was just talking about sort of the challenge now. I mean, I think we're in a supposedly post-racial era, the Obama era, colorblind society. And, uh, you know, race is not, and, and, and color, immigrant status, these things aren't supposed to matter, but the data say that they do. So how do you close that gap? 
if the data say that, whether it's educational outcomes and income, wealth, whatever it might be, uh, almost, almost without fail, you know, non-whites perform a lot, uh, perform worse than, than whites. And so I, I think the central challenge for progressives is sort of figure out how do you move forward on that agenda when you're not even supposed to talk about race or talk about color. I mean, I think it has something, you know, it, it, our national identity is different than it was. I mean, Woodrow Wilson's identity was as a white Southerner. Um, and, uh, and, 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 he sh and, the, and so everything else was a kind of other uh, to that. And you had both in that era and later in the New Deal a kind of accommodation um, with, the, with, the, with the politics of the white South for those reasons. I think we're in a different situation here. I think one of the most provocative and interesting little moments in the, in the book is when you identify Booker T. Washington as a sort of quintessential progressive figure. And, you know, there's a new biography of Washington. And it is kind of, you know, for somebody who always grew up with the, you know, in, you know, between Du Bois and Washington, you always go with Du Bois. Uh, it is actually, it, it is actually important to be reminded that there was, you know, that we, we could say that with a lot of hindsight. But it, in retrospect for the society of that time, building the capacity within that community uh, that, that Washington called for had its, had its value uh, as well. I mean, if, there, you know, if, I still, if I have to vote, I still cast the same vote. But there's, I think we've, we've, we've come to see a lot of value in, in, what, in what Washington was trying to do. And I think that's reflected in the current time in an understanding, among, which, is, which was a really important bracing understanding for liberals that there is more to life than you know, equal legal rights, and that, and that you do sometimes have to, have to, you know, have a certain amount of paternalism, a certain amount, you do have to sort of create the structures that allow communities to get ahead, not just create the basis of, 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 of equal opportunity, and that you really have to, have to build things like community banks and things like that, within, and acknowledge that, uh, acknowledge what goes on in different, in different communities, and, and think about family structure, acknowledge the importance of family structure and things like that. I mean, the, the era in which everybody was shocked by the Moynihan report and the fact that he would say that there, that, that, um, that it is over. I mean, we, we, we were able to, to confront those challenges in, a, in, a, in, in I think, a, a richer way. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Steve Schafferman with IncomeSecurityForAll.org. Uh, it seems to me that you make a sharp distinction between the progressives and the populists and say very little in the book about the mass movements for income security of Henry George, Edward Bellamy, and some of that ferment that uh, led to the good government uh, campaigns that the progressives talked about. And I wondered mm -hmm. if you'd just comment about that. Well, we, we do have quite a discussion on Henry George in the book um, in the context of relating this yeoman tradition to the desire or the necessity of, of asset ownership, broad scale asset ownership. Um, I think, you know, another part of what's hard to get at in the progressive era is. Um, I think a lot of the historiography um, puts a lot of emphasis on very colorful characters who, in the end of the day, weren't tremendously influential in their own time or were ahead of their time. And I would put Bellamy in that, that camp. Thank you so much for coming.